My name is Yaron Svore. In my younger days, I used to be a paratrooper in the army. Then I became a police detective. Later on, I began writing books. And eventually, I started lecturing about my life, both in the police and in the army. One evening, in the city of Bangor, in the state of Maine, I finished a lecture and got off stage, shook hands, had some small talk. An older man with stooped shoulders walks up to me and says, this was a great lecture. And I pull out my hand and he shakes my hands and says, great, thank you for coming. And I say, thank you very much. And as I want to pull my hand back, he won't let me. He's holding my hand in both of his. And he says, do you want to hear a story? And I felt very uncomfortable because I really didn't want to hear any stories. I had to get back to my hotel and fly the next morning back to New York. And I said, I'd really like to hear stories, but I have to catch an early plane tomorrow and I'd like to go back to the hotel. We'll speak another time. He looked at me and then threw his hands in exasperation and said, oh, so you don't want to hear a story about World War II, about 40 diamonds buried on the French border? You don't want to hear about it? It's okay. I immediately said, no, 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 no. Let's talk. We sit in the back of the lecture hall and this man, Sam, begins telling me a story about being a young GI during World War II. And it's an amazing story. It's not a story you read in history books or you watch in the movies. This is a real guy telling you a real story, and it's story fascinating. However, he gets to the point very quickly. Sam is leading the entire American army into the city of Strasbourg. Suddenly, German snipers start shooting at him. He tries to hide. He sees a large oak door to his right. He runs at the door, pushes it with his shoulder, unable to open it. He kicks it, still unable to open the door. He turns his rifle, shoots the door, and rushes in. When he gets used to the darkness of the room, he realizes he's inside a bank. And not only is he inside the bank, but three German soldiers are trying to rob the bank at the same moment. He shoots them, he throws a hand grenade, and kills the three Germans. He walks up to one of the German soldiers, and he realizes that the guy is holding a bag in his hand. He pushes the man's hand and pulls the bag. He looks at the bag and it's one of those old bags. It's a doctor's bag. He puts his hand in the bag and pulls out a little chamois pouch. He takes the pouch, pours its contents into his hands and realizes he's holding in his hands 40 uncut diamonds. Sam looks around, sees that no one is looking at him. He takes the diamonds, pours them back into the chamois bag, closes the bag and puts it in his backpack. Says nothing to anyone. The fighting continues for another two and a half weeks. Then he decides to bury the diamonds in his foxhole, figuring that if he'll live, he'll come back and take them. If he dies, no one cares. The next day, the order comes, attack, attack, attack. And Sam, with the rest of the American army, charge down the hill towards the Rhine River. As they are charging down the hill, suddenly Sam feels that he's hit by a truck. A piece of shrapnel hit him in the back. When it came out of his chest, his whole chest cavity opens. He's holding his side, he's holding his stomach, he doesn't know what to do because he's bleeding to death. Sam is telling me this story and we're sitting there for hours and eventually I stop him and say, Sam, why did you tell me this story? And he looks at me, he leans back a bit and says, you're a can-do kind of a guy, you are going to bring the diamonds. And I turn to him and say, why don't you go and bring the diamonds? He says, I can't. My wife won't let me. She says they are cursed. If I go back to the hill, she will divorce me. I smile and said, are you serious? He says, yes, I will never go back to that hill. I decided to go with my gut feelings. I felt that these diamonds were mine to be found. I arrive in France, I rent a car and I travel towards the Rhine River and start driving along the Rhine River. Suddenly, it hits me. This is the farm, this is the church, this is what Sam talked about. And I get out of my car and I look at the hill and I have to admit that I expected that on the hill there'll be a big neon sign saying the diamonds are here, but that didn't really happen. I climbed up the hill and I'm all very excited and I've got my shovel with me and my pick with me. And as I walk up the hill, I'm saying, okay, okay, you're gonna find it. When I get to the edge of the hill and I look around, I'm very upset because instead of finding one or two foxholes, I realize that the whole ridge 
is covered with foxholes, nearly 300 foxholes. But I'm undeterred. I said, okay, let's begin looking. I get to the hill on the sixth day. I have to admit I'm rather tired, but I'm still excited. Suddenly, from the forest, a man in a uniform walks up to me and he says, I'm the local gendarme. And he looks at me very sternly and says, what are you doing here? Do you have a permit? And I don't know why I answered as I did. I can't think of a reason. And yet, I looked at him straight in the face and I said, uh, I'm making a documentary movie about what happened here in the region. And instead of being mad at me, the guy looks at me and says, great, it's fantastic. You know what? They've all spoken about the history in the entire area, but no one spoke about our forest. No one has told the story of the Germans fighting the Americans here. Anything that I can do to help you. And I said, look, uh, I really would like somehow to meet someone who knows about the war in this region. And he smiles at me and says, well, you are in luck. We have a local historian who knows everything about the battles. He is the guy who knows anything about any fighting in this region during World War II. He gives me the man's name and address. The next day I cross the river. And as I cross the Rhine, I land on German soil. And for the first time in my life, I'm in Germany. I meet Herr Müller. He's the local historian. He begins telling me about the history of the war and of the battles that raged in that area. But as he speaks, he lets things slip. And very soon I begin realizing he's not only a historian, but he was actually a soldier in the Waffen-SS, in the murderous units of the Nazi army. He took part in the extermination of Jews. That broke everything. Suddenly the diamonds didn't matter anymore. Suddenly nothing mattered. I'm standing in front of a guy who's telling me that he was in the Waffen-SS. These are the murdering hordes of the Nazi army. These are the people who actually killed the Jewish people, the Waffen-SS. And this man sitting in front of me is a Nazi war criminal. I don't know what to do. Will I just leave? I don't know what to do. I'm trying to figure out what do I do? Do I choke this guy? Do I escape? From there, things began moving in a totally different direction. After meeting this man, I realized that my real and true mission wasn't looking for those lost diamonds. I was totally immersed in the job of spying and bringing to justice Nazi war criminals. I even infiltrated the neo-Nazi movement for an entire year as a spy within the movement. They actually believed that I was a neo-Nazi skinhead like them. When I came out and told my story to the German government, to the American government, there was a huge media explosion. I wrote a book entitled In Hitler's Shadow. The book was translated into many international languages. Eventually HBO turned my book into a movie entitled The Infiltrator. My life took a turn because all I did from then, for many years, was deal with escaped Nazis and with the attempts to bring them to justice. But then, after many years, towards the end of the millennium, in July, I decided to go back and search for the diamonds. I gathered a group of friends from America, from Germany and from Israel, and we went to the hill for one last try. Truly, I was skeptical. I didn't think the diamonds will be found. I've been to that hill many times. I didn't believe it. However, as we're walking across the hill and people are excited, looking for these diamonds for the first time, suddenly Mel Berger, my friend from William Morris, and Richard Hammer, the writer, start screaming, Yaron, Yaron, come here, come here. So we all walk behind Mel and Richard and we arrive at this huge fallen tree, very big tree. So I imagine that it must have been very old when it fell. And Richard points down and says, look, under the tree there is an outline of a foxhole. Now I have to admit, while I was on this hill for many times, I did not see this outline. Rick and Akko jump into the foxhole and start removing dirt and leaves with their hands. I'm standing there rather skeptical, as I said before. 
Then Rick turns around, holding in his hand a big uncut diamond. And that was it. I began crying. I felt as though the years of searching for these diamonds, everything has come to that moment. And I actually sat down crying like a baby while my friends kept on digging within that foxhole. And soon, within about five minutes, Richard and Mel walk up to me and Mel hands me over a baseball cap which belonged to one of the guys. And the baseball cap is full with uncut diamonds. I look at it and I know this is the greatest moment. This is when everything became real. This is the closing of the circle. I eventually became a well-known treasure finder and Nazi hunter. But treasure finding and Nazi hunting has its price.